Al Imam Ahmad Rahimahullah Ta'ala collected in his great book, Al Musnad, the great collection of hadith, a narration from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him. He said, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ma asaba abdan hammun wala huzn, aw hammun wala hazan, faqal, Allahumma inni abduk, ibn abdik, ibn amatik, nasiyati biyadik, maadin fiya hukmuk, عَدْلٌ فِيَّ قَضَاءُكْ أَسْأَلُكَ بِكُلِّ اسْمٍ هُوَ لَكْ سَمَّيْتَ بِهِ نَفْسَكْ أَوْ أَنْزَلْتَهُ فِي كِتَابِكْ أَوْ عَلَّمْتَهُ أَحَدًا مِنْ خَلْقِكْ أَوْ اسْتَأْثَرْتَ بِهِ فِي عِلْمِ الْغَيْبِ عِنْدَكْ أَنْ تَجْعَلَ الْقُرْآنَ الْعَظِيمَ رَبِيعَ قَلْبِي وَنُورَ صَدْرِي وَجَلَاءَ حُزْنِي وَذَهَابَ هَمِّي وَغَمِّي إِلَّا رَفَعَ اللَّهُ مَا بِهِ من هم وغم أو إلا أزال ما ما أزال الله ما به من هم وغم وأبدله بدل وأبدله فرحا فقالوا يا رسول الله أفلا نتعلم أفلا نتعلمهن قال بلى ينبغي لمن سمعهن أن يتعلمهن so this narration is from the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم on the authority of عبد الله بن مسعود may Allah be pleased with him that Allah's messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم said that there is no servant, no person, who is touched with either sadness or with worry, stress and concern. Except, and he says, or she says, Allahumma. So we're going to go over this dua, from the beautiful dua from the Prophet wasallam. And as you can see, it is about times of sadness, times of pain. Times of worry, concern. So if this person turns to Allah and says, Allahumma, O oh my God, O oh my Creator, O oh my Lord, Allahumma inni abduk, I am your servant, I am your slave. So I'm going to translate the hadith, then we will go over it with a little bit of explanation to see how we can utilize it. O oh my Lord, I am your servant, I am your slave. And the son of your slave. And the son also of your slave. So my father and my mother are your servants as well. Your judgment is going to pass. It's going to be a reality. I can't push it back. Whatever you right to happen in your in my life whatever you decide to happen in my life it is fair and just you only treat me with justice i ask you with every name of yours sammayta bihi nafsak a name with which you call yourself you refer you to yourself with aw anzaltahu fi kitabik or a name that you send down in your book in your revelation أو علمته أحدا من خلقك or a name that you taught to any of your creation أو استأثرت به في علم الغيب عندك or you kept this knowledge or the knowledge of this name to yourself أن تجعل القرآن العظيم ربيع قلبي that you make the great glorious Quran as rain showers for my heart Sadri and the light and the enlightened and my stress. If a person says this, Allah would remove, Allah will remove. Allah will replace the sadness and the worry with joy and happiness. So the companion said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, shall we not learn these words? The Prophet said, Everyone who hears these words should learn them. So let's go over this dua. And it's not just words that we say, it's a way of life. It's a very profound hadith. It's a state that we get ourselves in. Allahumma. So first we call upon Allah, oh Allah, you are my Lord. 
You are the only one that I worship. You are the one that I, that I give my ultimate love to. My devotion belongs to you. You are the only one who deserves this. My Lord, there's a connection. Allahumma anta rabbi. You are my Lord. You are in charge of me. You are in charge of my affairs. You are my originator. I came from you. You created me. You brought me into existence. I belong to you. You are my Lord. You are my master. So here you define Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the first definition. The second definition, Allahumma la ilaha illa ant. Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa ant. No one deserves to be worshipped. No one has the right to devotion and ultimate love except you. Khalaqtani, you created me. You originated me. You brought me into existence. With a purpose. وَأَنَا abduk. I am your servant. I am your slave. I'm your property. I am yours. I belong to you. So here you define yourself. These are the foundational definitions of life. Who Allah is and who you are. And then the relationship between you and Allah. I am your servant. I am yours. I don't even belong to myself. I belong to you. I don't even own myself. I came from you. You originated me. I don't have a necessary existence. I don't have an intrinsic existence. You brought me into existence. And thus I am yours. I am your property. And I am at your service. And I am obedient to you. You are the master. I am this slave. I am the servant. You decide and you say and I obey. That's who I am and that's who you are. And that's the nature of the relationship. So you put yourself where you belong. And you give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what he deserves. Ibn Abdik. It's not that I, it's not only that I am your slave and servant, but I am the son of your slave and my father, my ancestors. And this includes all of your ancestors till Adam alayhi salam. All of us are the servants of Allah. Ibn Amatik and my mother as well is your servant. This is a definition of all of us, including <coughs> The sources through which I came into this existence, my parents, and their parents, and their parents, and so on. Nasiyati biyadik. My affairs are in your hand, are under your control. When you decide something, it happens. When you write something upon me, it takes place. And this is, there's also a pledge here. That wherever you, whatever you decide, I will follow. I will obey. I am here to fulfill whatever you want from me. Nasiyati biyadik. I'm going to follow everything. Maadin fiya hukmuk. Your judgment is going to come to pass when it comes with, when it comes to me, to my life. So this has to do with the qadar of Allah. Whatever Allah subhanahu wa taala wrote down in the preserved ta preserved tablet is going to take place. No one can push that back. So here you are acknowledging the might and the power of Allah. Ma'adun fi hukmuk. Whatever you judge, that's going to take place. That's going to happen. No dispute about this. Adulun fi qadauk. Your judgment, whatever you allow to happen in this life, whatever you bring into my life, from you, it is justice, it is fair. You never, you never deal someone a bad hand. You never extend injustice to your creation. So this is a recognition of what is coming to you from Allah. First, you recognize who Allah is and you define that clearly for yourself. Then you define who you are clearly. And then you define the relationship between you and Allah and what is the communication from Allah to you. And you acknowledge that since Allah is the master, the Rabb, the Lord, that whatever He judges happens. And whatever comes from Him is good and is fair and just. 
Adlun fiya qadauk. So here you are referring to the qadr, but it also has another meaning. Your qada in terms of legislation, because that's another qada from Allah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do or don't, halal and haram, the principles, the beautiful principles of Islam, of justice, mercy, of compassion, of truth, and the warning against the evil principles of injustice, oppression, harm, etc. All of that is fair from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah only commands that, that, that which is good. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِيْتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَيَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغِي Indeed, Allah commands only that which is just and fair and al-ihsan which is greater than justice which is actually going the extra mile with doing good excellence وَإِيْتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى being kind to those who are related to you وَيَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ Allah warns against lewdness and evil acts, despicable acts. That's what, that's what comes from Allah. Enjoining the good, forbidding the evil. Although Allah Himself, He is the one who defines good because good does not have any independent existence apart from Allah. Good is from Allah. Good is the definition of Allah Himself. إِنَّ اللَّهَ طَيِّبٌ and everything that comes from Allah is good. And everything about Allah is good. That's what, that's what, this is what the definition of good is. So we say, Adlun Whatever you command is fair and just and is beautiful. This is not a compliment. This is not just a, an empty praise. This is an acknowledgement of a, of a truth. As'aluka bi kulli ismin huwalak. I ask you, by every name of yours. And Allah has many beautiful names. They're not only 99. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that says, For Allah, there are 99 names, 100 minus 1. And then the hadith continues in a Tirmidhi. This hadith does not limit the names and attributes of Allah to 99, but it, it, it refers to specific 99 names of those of Allah. Allah has more names. Because Allah is complete and perfect. And His names describe and denote His beauty and His perfection. So I ask you by every name of yours that you have given to yourself or that have used to refer to yourself or that you have sent down in revelation or that you have taught to any specific servant of your creation or that you have even kept to yourself I ask you by all of your names to make the Quran Rabi'a Qalbi Rabi' Rabi in the Arabic language the original meaning is rain we use it to describe spring but the meaning is rain the Quran is rain is hydration is life for the heart so you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow the Qur'an to occupy its place in your life, which is bringing life to your heart, awakening the heart. Because the heart without connection to Allah is dead. And you can live physically with a dead, spirit, with a dead spiritual heart. So you're asking Allah to make the Qur'an the source of life for your heart, Rabi'a Qalbi, Wa Noora Sadri, and the light, the illumination in my chest. Wa Jala'a Huzni, and the washing, the rinsing away of my sadness, and the removal of my stress and my agony. And then Allah would answer this dua. Now, this is not, as, I, as we said, this is, these are not just empty words. There, is, there, are, there are facts and truths behind this. What the Qur'an does, if we allow the Qur'an to play its role, to run its course in our lives, things change drastically. Because what the Qur'an does, it gives two things. You wake up from the slumber of everyday life. 
You wake up to the bigger meaning of life. To your purpose that is built in you. And part of, part of you recognizes it. And that's why you seek meaning. That's why you have big questions about life. Why am I here? What is my life about? Why did I come into existence? What's the meaning of all of this? Where am I going to? What's going to happen after death? And the feeling that you need to do something valuable with your life. You need to make a good investment of your life. That's intrinsic to every human being. Where does it come from? That's the seed of faith in your life that can be, that can be grown with the rain and the water that is the Qur'an. You need to water it, that seed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَوَمَنْ كَانَ مَيْتًا فَأَحْيَيْنَاهُ A person who had been dead, but to whom we gave life, we revived, we brought this person back to life. وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُ نُورًا And we gave, offered this person, or granted this person light. يَمْشِي بِهِ فِي النَّاسِ This light helps this person navigate the path among other people. Is this similar to the example of someone who is dead and who dwells in darkness? And this is what we find in this hadith, the Qur'an. We're asking Allah to make the Qur'an as rain to revive our hearts and to be the light in our chests because that's what we need to navigate this world. And the Qur'an is the source for that. So when you read the Qur'an, when you embrace the Qur'an, when you stop placing conditions and expectations on the Qur'an, because it's the word of your Lord, you stop placing conditions, you allow it to do its own work in your life with full submission, then it's going to do its work. It's going to fix your inner workings. It's going to open your heart to see the reality of this life, to see paradise and the hellfire, and to see with a clear vision in your heart what you are meant to do with, in, with your life. And then it will give you the guidance, the light as to how to navigate this world, the intricacies of it, the path that you should take. But the problem is we don't allow the Quran to do this in our lives. So in this dua, you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to let the Quran be what is meant to be in my life. The source of life, a revival, and a source of light. And with this, you can handle every situation. That's why when this happens, when this becomes a reality in your life, what happens? The sadness is repelled. The stress and the worry are removed. So the Quran is not just there for us to tell us what's halal and haram or to limit us, or to place constraints upon us. It's a source of life and light. It upgrades our life, it elevates our lives. But sometimes from this small corner that we force ourselves in, and we start placing expectations on Allah and on the Quran. We read the Quran as a textbook. We're expecting the Quran to be like those bestsellers. We expect it to communicate to us in a, just like humans communicate to humans. We place the demands and the expectations of our culture and our time on a book from the creator of the heavens and the earth. So we limit it. We limit it, but when we allow it to be in our lives, to reside in our hearts, to be a source of guidance, to have an organic relationship with the Qur'an, let the Qur'an teach you, let the Qur'an guide you, let the Qur'an grow and live within you, then you will start to see that life will start to make more sense. Your life will become more meaningful. You'll understand why things happen, why Allah allows things that puzzle most of humanity. You will start to see through that. Why is it happening? And then you can transcend hardship, calamity, sadness, etc. That's the power of the Qur'an. But the problem is, unless you are in a receptive mode, it doesn't happen. So the, here we see the relationship, the connection between our inner state, our well-being, our state of well-being, and the state of Iman. They are strongly connected. They're strongly connected. And there's a strong connection between being a good person and being a healthy person in every sense and being a true Muslim.
But we have severed these connections, we have compartmentalized these connections, and practicing Islam has become robotic. So Islam is one thing, life is one thing, your emotional state is another thing, and we are dealing with a fragmented life. And hence we have a lot of issues and problems. So it's important to co co contemplate this hadith, this dua, and learn it as the Prophet ﷺ encouraged at the end of it, and try to live its meanings. And it's not like an instant, but something will happen instantly. But it's a journey and it's a process that you need to build, you need to advance, you need to build momentum. And every time you, you practice this narration and you live it, you're going to reap more of its fruits. So I'm going to conclude with this. And oftentimes the question comes, uh, is the person who has Iman immune to mental illness? Or what's the relationship between Iman and mental illness or mental well-being? And there's a problem with this question. Because mental illness is not one thing. It's, it, it's, it's an umbrella for different conditions. Some mental illness is a matter of physiology, neurology. So there is some kind of a birth defect in the brain. Or maybe there's an injury in the brain and it causes something. It causes some sort of a condition. That's different. That's just when someone is born, for example, without a, without a limb, without a hand, without an arm. You can't say, oh, this person becomes a good Muslim, they're going to grow an arm. The same thing applies to this kind of uh, psychological conditions that are a result of neurology. But there are some mental conditions that are caused because of one's view of life. The way a person processes life, the, one, the, 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 the style or the way the person sees himself or herself in the world and what is their relationship with the world. That leads to traumatic experiences. And this is what actually psychologists call self-inflicted pain. Sometimes our expectations make us miserable. It's not the experience, but it's our expectations. So again, it's important to understand that we can, you cannot answer a question like this because it's a too generic, too generic. But is there a relationship between our emotional, psychological well-being and Iman? Absolutely. Absolutely, Iman changes your view on the world. It restores the true and accurate vision. And it brings life into your heart. And a lot of pain in the human experience comes from the fact that the hearts are dead, that we nourish the body. We try to nourish our minds and our heads, but we forget our hearts. And we insist that we can treat that either with medication or we can treat it with just some kind of, of therapy. But we are forgetting that our essence is spiritual and there is a need for the soul to be revived, to be nourished, to be given the necessary nutrients. And without having, without developing that balance, we would definitely suffer. And Allah promised in the Quran, Whoever does righteousness and goodness in this life, when they are in a state of belief, when they truly believe in Allah, then we shall give them a goodly life. We shall give them a goodly life. And if we reflect on the lives of the prophets, peace be upon them, and the righteous people, you can see some of them went through excruciating challenges. And they had pain and they suffered from sadness. These are normal human emotions. Negative emotions are very healthy and necessary. But they did not lose balance. They experienced sadness, but they experienced hope at the same time. They went through pain and worry, but they had trust in Allah at the same time. So they had a rich emotional and psychological repertoire just because they tapped into more depth into their being. So it's important to learn this hadith. It's narrated by Imam Ahmed from Abdullah bin Mas'ud. I encourage everyone to learn it. You can look it up inshallah on Google. And I recommend that you learn it every time you go through some hard times. Call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala using this dua and have unconditional trust in Allah and you will see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deliver you. Uh, as I conclude, there is an organization, uh, I don't want to pronounce them wrong, but they are collecting uh, funds for a lot of the civilians in Afghanistan who've lost their home, 
who are going through, again, you know what the conditions are. People lost their home, people lost their families, and there are people in dire need. So they are collecting these funds that are going to go to these civilians. So please support them with everything you can. And whoever delivers a believer when they are in dire need, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will deliver them from uh, the uh, from the hard moments on the day of judgment. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from all of us. Allahumma ghfir al-mu'minina wal-mu'mina.